Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction. And it's always such a pleasure and honor to be invited to speak at one of these lunchtime symposiums. So I'll hope I do it justice in the next uh, 20 minutes or so. Um, really, SMI, as uh, we all know, is one of uh, Toshiba's uh, main uh, revolutionary product. Uh, and I was going to go over some of his applications in the MSK, uh, where I think it has a real big part to play, and also perhaps some uh, influences where it can help with, um, in the abdominal application, and then just a brief mention of a new tool called Smart 3D, and then the ever-improving 2D shear wave elastography uh, uh, provided by the system. So really on to super microvascular imaging and MSK application. Well, on the background, from the MSK side, power Doppler ultrasound is really seen as the modality of choice to assess whether there is active inflammation within joints or tendons, and this is quite widely accepted. Of course, it has the advantage over MRI, where it is easy to perform, very accessible, and much, much cheaper. From then comes along super microvascular imaging, or SMI, which I really see as an advancing Doppler ultrasound technology uh, by uh, Toshiba, and it really allows the visualization of the slow flowing vessels, and this is performed without the need for ultrasound contrast. And this is done by some very innovative technology, by the use of some unique Doppler algorithms and filters, and it really provides exquisite spatial resolution. It comes in the color SMI or monochrome uh, SMI mode, which is a little bit more sensitive, and one of the uh, modalities we would prefer to use would be the MSMI. So here are some examples where it can be uh, very useful and shows a difference where this patient with a tibialis posterior tendon clearly shows increased vascularity on power Doppler, but when you switch to SMI, you can actually see these very, very small, exquisite, small flowing vessels. Switch over now to a patient with a midfoot synovitis, and you can see marked synovial thickening, and here is the color form of SMI, and you can actually see very small vessels flowing into the joint itself and the surrounding inflamed synovium. It also works with very, very small joints. And here is an index finger in a patient with rheumatoid arthritis. You can see there is some flow around and in the joint itself, but this becomes much clearer with improved spatial resolution and sensitivity. So you can actually see these small vessels right deep down uh, into the joint itself, which was difficult to appreciate with power Doppler. So I hear you say, well, so what? We can see this vascularity with power Doppler. We get better spatial resolution. Does it make a difference? Well, we carried out a study, and we've been uh, adding to our numbers since, to assess the efficacy of SMI in detecting inflammation in joints compared with power Doppler, where it is the gold standard for denoting active synovitis. We recruited patients who came for routine ultrasound scans at our hospital uh, since 2013, and we included an analysis if we saw either changes on B mode or signal on power Doppler or signal on SMI. I acquired these video clips and images stored for later uh, blinded analysis, and we used the 18 megahertz probe and Aplio 500 scanner. And if there was any doubt whether there was signal or not on power Doppler or SMI or whether it was artifact, then we used spectral Doppler to confirm whether it was noise or true signal. This was then read by three musculoskeletal radiologists. Uh, all have more than 10 years experience of MSK. And they were asked to score if they saw vascularity within the joints with power Doppler, SMI, or both. And if they saw a signal on both power Doppler and SMI, they were also asked to score on a four-point visual analog scale whether power Doppler or SMI were better, which one they preferred based on sensitivity and spatial resolution. So to date, there have been 83 uh, patients analyzed so far with a mean age of about 44 years and a female predominance. This encompassed 134 joints. So we have data on 134 joints on a mixture of arthritis, predominantly OA, psoriatic arthritis, and rheumatoid arthritis, and a few inflammatory uh, arthritis. 
So to answer the question so far, is SMI better than power Doppler? Well, in this cohort of patients, you will see that in 89 of those joints, signal was seen on SMI and power Doppler. None showed any uh, signal with uh, power Doppler, but not with SMI. And the key thing here is in 40 cases, signal was only seen with SMI, but not with power Doppler. And I'm going to show you a few examples of these cases. So here is a patient with a quite a destroyed joint and marked synovial hypertrophy. And you can see there is very little signal with power Doppler. And when we switch to SMI, you can actually see these vessels run very, very clearly. So just again, the power Doppler, not many, any signal, and when you switch over to SMI, you clearly see these vessels within the joint denoting an active synovitis. Another patient, again, with a rheumatoid arthritis, and this is in a small metacarpal phalangeal joint, very little flow with power, but with SMI, you can actually see clear vessels within the joint itself, so denoting active synovitis. And in some cases where it's not clear on power Doppler, for example, in this case with really marked synovial hypertrophy, was that artifact, there's a bit of calcium there, wasn't very clear with the power Doppler. And when you switch over to SMI, then there is no question that there is vascular flow within the synovial hypertrophy itself, denoting an active synovitis itself. So really quite a powerful tool, changing the outcome of whether you think there is active synovitis or not. And when the readers saw vascularity on both power Doppler and SMI, their visual analog scale, they were asked to show which they thought was better. Well, in the majority, uh, SMI outperformed uh, power Doppler based on spatial resolution and sensitivity. And so really the key take home messages are, is SMI more sensitive than power Doppler ultrasound? Well, 40 of our patients showed vascularity only with SMI. And in the majority of these patients that we saw vascularity with both power Doppler and SMI, they had a higher score with SMI. And in only one case out of these 89 joints, the, the reader score power Doppler to be a little bit more sensitive than SMI there was really very, very good inter-observer agreement between all three readers. So what clinical impact does this have? Well, OMERACT, the Outcome Measures in Rheumatology and Ultrasound, part of the EULA, the European League Against Arthritis, have come up with a power Doppler ultrasound scoring system to denote active synovitis. But here we are de detecting inflammation in joints, which was not possible with power Doppler, and also importantly, without the need for contrast ultrasound. Of course, this needs further validation in ultrasound scans, uh, studies, multi-center studies, but this surely would hopefully lead to early detection and treatment of active disease, and hence starting of modifying agents, and perhaps can give an indicator of prognosis and prediction of relapse in these patients with arthritis. Of course, there's some limitations to our study. We had 10 normal healthy volunteers and none showed any vascularity in their MCPJs with power Doppler or SMI. Uh, they were not age matched. This tended to be in our younger group. Uh, but really, the patients act as their own controls because their other unaffected joints uh, did not show any signal on power Doppler or SMI. There is, of course, a slight lack of a quantitative analysis in our study, but there is now development of the vascularity index, only available in uh, color SMI, where you can actually draw a freehand region of interest around the vascularity, and it gives you an index uh, of a pixel count of where the color flow is. So it can be very helpful. And one other tool which we find has much promise is in the Smart 3D. Very easy to use. Just one sweep through your hands or, 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 or a region of interest, and you can reconstruct in the coronal and sagittal plane very, very easily without any specialized probes. And what we're starting to see as well were this cartilage on the C plane, which we see much more clearly, which we weren't able to. And in future, with combined with SMI on itself, could be a very, very powerful tool at evaluating 
these joints. So just here you go, several planes in the sagittal and coronal plane uh, of this metacarpal phalangeal joint. So a very, very small joint and very easy to perform. So really, in Ryan's powerful tool for MSK imaging, what about our bread and butter routine standard abdominal applications? Does SMI have a role? Well, I just wanted to show you some examples of where it can be helpful in your day-to-day -day clinical practice. I mean, it's taken uh, uh, the gospel that contrast enhanced ultrasound, the enhancement characteristics are really the key for the characterization. However, is it always necessary in some cases? And uh, some of our evidence is a bit anecdotal, but I'm just going to illustrate this to you. And in some cases, you can use SMI with contrast enhanced ultrasound, which can also be very beneficial. So here's an example of an incidental finding in a patient with an SMI mode here. You've got your B mode localizer, slightly hyperechoic lesion, perhaps with a central scar, but when I start this video clip, you can actually see the stellate appearance, the spoke wheel appearance of the vascular flow, which you can also see with power Doppler, but perhaps you don't appreciate the smaller vessels as well. So we then gave contrast to characterize this lesion further, and you can see the beautiful spoke wheel enhancement pattern from the center outwards of this lesion, clearly denoting focal nodular hyperplasia. And in the late phase, this lesion did not wash out and showed very nice enhancement characteristics where there was a central scar. Of course, you can turn on SMI and apply to Smart 3D, and what you get is a beautiful pattern of the spoke wheel stellate appearance of the vessels filling from the center outwards. So really quite uh, uh, powerful tools here to help with the day-to-day -day clinical practice. Contrast this to perhaps a patient with known liver cirrhosis. You can see a cirrhotic liver and a focal liver lesion. Well, SMI is so good to show the vascularity within this lesion, and on a background of chronic liver disease, this has to be a hepatocell carcinoma until proven otherwise. Perhaps in this case, it may obviate the need for contrast ultrasound for you to characterize that further. Here's a case where SMI was really quite helpful in helping us achieve the diagnosis. This is a patient with a lung cancer, and there was a blush seen in the right liver on CT, and there was asked for us to look at it on ultrasound to see whether we could characterize it further. We thought we might see a hemangioma that was maybe an echogenic lesion here, very, very difficult to see and focus on with contrast ultrasound. But what we did notice with contrast was this hypervascular lesion here very close to a vessel and really didn't behave like a hemangioma. It was very close to the vessel and what entered our mind was, could this be a vascular malformation? Well, we turned on SMI after contrast and here you can clearly shows that efferent and efferent feeding vessels and draining veins from this vascular malformation much more clearly than we could see with contrast enhanced ultrasound. So providing better special resolution of those vessels with SMI can be very helpful in certain cases. One other key area where perhaps it has uh, some use in our day-to-day -day clinical practice is the detection of vascular lesions, which we don't always pick up with color or power Doppler because it's much more sensitive in renal lesions, where it's important to know whether a lesion is vascular or not. And the question is, do we still need to give contrast if it's a vascular lesion in the kidney? Well, here is an example where this was proved very, very helpful because you can see this patient has got multiple cysts. And we thought that these were all just going to be simple cysts. You can see a nice anechoic appearance of these cysts and true transmission. When we turned on color Doppler, these cysts really did not show any flow at all. But we turned on SMI, and the larger of the two cysts actually showed some signal within it. And you can actually see some small vessels within it, denoting that it probably wasn't just a simple cyst and it was a vascular lesion. And you can see here again, we honed in on that lesion and you can see the small vessels which we couldn't appreciate with Kala or power Doppler. We of course gave contrast and as you'll see in this early arterial phase, this lesion here is actually a solid lesion, not a cyst and enhances quite avidly with contrast and this simple cyst adjacent to it was very bland. Of course, you can see these microbubbles much better once you give contrast. This is the monochrome version of SMI. 
And you can see that larger lesion now showing those vascular pattern we already saw without color, uh, without contrast. And it's much more enhanced with contrast. And you can see with the color mode, maybe it depicts that that is the solid lesion, that cyst remain completely bland. So really it's some useful tools and it's really changing our diagnosis on day-to-day -day practice and perhaps in some cases could avoid the use of contrast enhanced ultrasound. So turning over to one of the other uh, improvements and uh, ap specialized applica advanced applications uh, which the APLU 500 system offers is in Toshiba's shear wave technology. It is 2D imaging shear wave technology, and the latest version, version 6, really has a very nice feature, which is the propagation map, which distinguishes it from other scanners and systems, which actually tells you how well your shear wave has propagated within your organ of interest, and to allow you to use uh, your region of interest placement a lot more accurately uh, and more reliably. So here's an example of the latest version. You can actually see this is in a normal liver. You have your map and scale here in kilopascals, quite homogeneous. But a nice feature is the propagation map here, which shows very uniform symmetrical bars, suggesting that this is a good acquisition and we can take our region of interest measurement here. I put this here as well, very close to the liver capsule surface, just showing you that when you're performing this in liver, uh, to look for liver fibrosis, you should avoid this one centimeter because it does give you a highly false elevated reading because of the stiffness of the liver capsule. So we should be below that, but this is a nice example to illustrate that. Of course, one other feature uh, here is the variance map, which can sometimes be helpful to look at the heterogeneity within the uh, acquisition itself. This is a patient with liver cirrhosis. You can see this is in meters per second, very high readings and values itself, and perhaps some value looking at the variance map as well. One other key feature that has proved really helpful in day-to-day -day, uh, clinical practice is the availability now of a worksheet. So that was been much needed and allows you to acquire 10 to uh, 12 uh, <clears throat> acquisitions of your liver, very much like what we're used to with uh, FibroScan, our transient elastography, uh, one of the first uh, shear wave uh, systems uh, available. Uh, and it gives you a lot of data which you can then use to calculate how good your acquisition is by giving you readings in speeds and the elasticity in kilopascals and providing an interquartile range, so giving you how good uh, the spread of the data is. So very, very useful tools now, and it keeps continually improving. I'd just like to draw your attention to some uh, preliminary data uh, being presented by Dr. Giovanna Farioli from the University of Pavia, and she's got an electronic poster looking and comparing Toshiba's 2D shear wave elastography with FibroScan. So I'd just like to draw your attention to that. And of course, in the pipeline, there's a multiple uh, European study looking at the use of Toshiba shear wave elastography and staging liver fibrosis. Uh, there are five centers so far enrolled uh, over four countries. I put down UK as part of the multi-European center for now. <laughs> and um, we're anticipating some preliminary data in June 2016. So really, in conclusion, on that whistle-stop tour of how useful SMI can be, really one of the key areas where I think it will play an important role is that we're starting to detect low-grade inflammation, which we couldn't, with power Doppler in joints or tendons. And this would have significant impact on denoting active synovitis and hence treatment of these patients with arthritis. So certainly a, 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 a new powerful tool that's uh, coming on here. With liver and renal applications, perhaps uh, it can obviate the need for contrast ultrasound in some cases. And in some cases, we find it very complementary when used in conjunction with contrast ultrasound. Of course, I've not had time in this 20 minutes to discuss many other applications uh, which have been proven very useful for SMI, such as vascular applications, uh, looking at endoleaks, uh, obstetric and gynecological as uh, applications, and certainly now our pediatric applications are very, very useful too, especially if you don't want to give contrast. And Toshiba Shear Wave Elastography continues to improve and currently shows much promise as a tool for assessing liver fibrosis. 
So with that, I thank you for your attention, and I'd like to acknowledge all my colleagues at uh, Imperial College who partook in the uh, MSK study, and also our colleagues in Toshiba Medical Systems UK and Europe and Japan who've uh, provided so much support uh, to us to carry out all these studies. So thank you very much for your attention.